everybody, this is Caitlin here and today we have another Force of Will deck profile video for today. I was kind of thinking about different ideas and stuff and trying to do something that maybe is a little bit out there that maybe isn't something that people would immediately think of to play. This is more kind of like a fun deck where, you know, it's kind of fitting for a theme. As you know, I like to work with themes and stuff. So the kind of idea for this one is going back to one of the very first rulers that we got for Alice Cluster, which is the titular Alice herself. Obviously, anyone who remembers uh, Seven Kings of the Land, that booster box, this Alice is obviously the Alice that has two different J-Ruler forms. So this one, she starts off as Alice the Girl in the Looking Glass. She is a water, wonder slash pawn. Her J-Activate is just one water and one void, which, you know, is pretty easy to flip. Also, you can tap her and you can search your main deck for a card named Deep Blue, the Phantom Board, which is her regalia in a sense. And you can reveal it and put it into your hand and then shuffle your main deck. And, you know, since it's like a zero cost regalia, you can easily put it into your field. It doesn't cost anything. So when we flip her over, we get Alice the Valkyrie of Fairy Tales, which I kind of prefer this form over to, over to the Saint of Healing or whatever it's called, the kind of the blue-green one version of her. I kind of prefer this version of her more. So she's a 1000-1000, which is pretty awesome for like a J-Ruler. She gets a water, well, she's technically a water and fire J-Ruler, which is pretty nice. And when this card enters your field, you search your main deck for a fairy tale resonator, you reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your main deck. Counters on your fairy tales you control cannot be removed by effects, which is, you know, pretty essential because a lot of the cards in this deck do focus on counters. And then the God's Art Leaping Dance is one fire and one water. This card deals 500 damage to a target Resnair. You can pay one, and if you do, you copy this ability, and you can choose a new target for it if you'd like, and you can only play the God's Art once. So essentially, um, what we're mainly looking to do is kind of build up a field and, you know, kind of J-activate and make sure that we can keep counters on our Resonators that, you know, do all sorts of things with counters and stuff. But since she is 1000-1000, she's one of our biggest uh, kind of like bodies in terms of like what we're attacking with. A lot of the other stuff in here is like little things that can get stronger, but she's like going to be like really awesome. Like if we can end the game with her, it is kind of pretty counterintuitive. So like you kind of don't want to flip her too early because you want to flip her when you know that you can get in that finishing blow of like 1000-1000, which is pretty nice. Moving on to the Resonators, we've got three different one drops. I have mixed in like a couple of things from Grim Cluster in here, um, purely because that's where most fairy tale stuff comes from. When uh, Grim rotates out in September, once we get Lapis Cluster, obviously we're going to be losing a lot of fairy tale support. But I'm kind of hoping that either they keep with it and they keep building stuff that can support it, or you know it might end up falling to the wayside because we will lose a lot of fairy tale support. So first of all, we're going for Hunter in the Black Forest. Now, normally you would see this a lot in like uh, wolf decks or whatever because it's obviously a one-drop fire with swiftness. But as you can see, he's a fairy tale slash human. He's not a wolf or anything like that. So he is a 300-300, you know, which is kind of average for something that's one cost. But he has swiftness, which is like the main uh, the main thing that we're looking for is that he's an early attacker. We can drop him turn one if we like manage to hit a stone that produces fire. And, you know, we can hit for at least 300 damage on the first go. So... Uh, if we go first, you know, that's still pretty good. You get 300 damage off straight away, which is kind of nice. Next, we have four copies of Thumbelina, which is obviously another one cost from the Moonlit Saviour. She has zero attack and 600 defense, so it kind of makes up for the fact that she's a one drop. She does have, you know, considerable defense for something that you can normally play turn one. She just doesn't have any attack, so she's kind of vulnerable to dark spells that destroy things with, like, less than 400 attack and so on. But you can tap her and put a support counter on this card. And then when you tap her, you can target any of your J slash resonators, and they gain 200-200 for each support counter on this card until the end of the turn. And then you remove all support counters uh, after that. So, you know, you can tap this each turn, build up the support and stuff. And then when the time is right, you can just give all that support to one uh, resonator or even your J-Ruler. So then you can just swing in for big. And then, you know, you lose all those counters. But uh, that depends really on whether Alice is flipped or not. And then the last one drop that we have is Alice's Little Scout. Now, she isn't a fairy tale. Sadly, she's a soldier. But she's really only mainly in here because, one, she's a one-drop blue. Uh, two, she has like a support ability with the phantom board and whatnot, and also that when she is killed from your field, you can draw a card. So, in the place of Cheshire Cat, because I felt like even though Cheshire Cat is a fairy tale, it doesn't really synergize very well with this deck. We're not really looking too heavily into like drawing or whatever or shuffling our deck a lot. We're mainly just like looking to build up a field of fairy tales, and you know, Cheshire Cat isn't really 
needed necessarily. I wouldn't just toss it in here just cause. I feel like I'd only put it in here if I felt like it had a place. So that's the reason Cheshire Cat isn't in here and why the Little Scout is. Moving on to our two drops. Two drops that we have as essential for any kind of like Valkyrie deck or whatever with Alice. We have four Snow Whites and I'll pick up the non-stamped one just because it's easier to read. So obviously Sil Cinderella, the Valkyrie of Glass, she's 200-800 and she's a fairy tale. And when this card enters your field, you can put a glass counter on it. And then this card gains plus 600 attack as long as it has a glass counter on it. And whenever this card deals damage, you remove a glass counter. But then you can also pay two blue and return it to your hand. So essentially... You cast it, you get the glass counter on it, it goes up to a, like about 800 attack, and then next turn when you do attack, you remove the counter, but then you can also return it to your hand and, you know, keep playing it or whatever to get that boost up. Plus, for a two drop, she's got 800 defense, which is really nice considering, you know, we kind of want to, like, stall our opponent from attacking us too much, you know, we want to keep our stuff on the field. And next, for our other two drop that we have, we have the Little Matchstick Girl, which I really like. It's one of my uh, favourite cards or whatever, especially for a fire fairy tale. We need to get more fire fairy tales. I feel like there's not enough of them. They're mainly blue, I noticed. So we need more fire fairy tale support because that would really help with Alice a whole deal. So obviously she's a two drop. She's 600-600. She's got like two different awakenings. So like you've got the first awakening, which is when she enters your field, you can search your deck for X cards named Ma Magic Matchstick, reel them and put them into your hand, then you shuffle your deck. And when she enters your field, you can put X target named Magic Matchstick from your graveyard into your hand. Also, if you discard the Magic Matchstick, then you can deal 400 damage to a target to your resonator. So mainly, like, you'll see, like, we're running matchsticks in here, mainly just for the combo for the matchstick girl. And, you know, she's pretty, she's pretty cool, you know, she can burn, she can burn other people's uh, resonators and stuff. So she's essentially our kind of go-to for um, burning damage on them and stuff instead of just outright attacking them. It is a little bit kind of wor oddly worded for the for the two different awakenings, but you can probably get around it or whatever. Plus, you know, she is pretty cute and I like, I like how most of this deck, well, the majority of this deck is a rather cute looking deck. Uh, moving on to three drops now, and we're going to be running three of the flower prints. I was debating actually not just putting him in there because I was just like, uh, he's not really that great considering he's a three drop that's 400 400, which is kind of sucky, but um, he will get boost um, considering the kind of addition that we've got. So, what he does is our other fairy tale resonators that we control can be targeted by spells or abilities that your opponent controls. And then, if you rest another uh, recovered fairy tale or resonator, you control this guard gets plus 200 uh, defense until the end of the turn so we probably won't be doing that second ability mainly because we don't really care too much if he dies we'd rather protect our other fairy tales which is why he's here in the first place so they can't get targeted by spells or abilities and um, so that's that's the real only reason i'm running three i wouldn't run four this mainly just because it'd be clogging it up too much considering he's not that great we're not swinging with him or anything like that which he's mainly just here to try and protect the stuff that we already have Next we have, to complement the Cinderella, we have the Snow White, the Valkyrie of Passion, who is our three drop. She's 500, 700, she's got Swiftness and First Strike. And whenever she attacks, you can put a Passion counter on her. And whenever she attacks, we can deal 300 damage to a target resonator for each Passion counter on our, uh, not Cinderella, our Snow White. And then we remove the Passion counter from it. So um, I do run this in Sylvia. I am contemplating taking it out of Sylvia and replacing it with maybe Gareth the other night or whatever. But I feel like uh, Snow White works better with this deck in terms of like the counter abilities and whatnot. And, you know, she's a swiftness. So we've got two cards in here that can at least deal swiftness. And obviously Magic Max Ma ugh, magic Matchstick, if I can say it correctly, can obviously give swiftness if we're playing it onto a resonator or whatnot. So we do have that option of getting some swiftness out. Plus, she's 700 defense. She's maybe not the strongest attacker or whatnot for, for a three drop but she's still got de decent defense so she can at least like help protect the field a little bit and the last three drop that we have is only running it at two and it is Edna the Snow Queen. Uh, I only actually own two copies of this, which is why I'm only running it at two. I might have run it at three if I had another copy, but sadly I don't. Uh, she's mainly in here just because I purely like love her artwork and I really like this card. She's a 700-700, obviously, fairy tale slash queen. And her awakening is you can pay X and you rest a uh, target resonator. Uh, well, actually, you rest X target resonator. So say if you pay two, you rest two resonators that your opponent controls. And they cannot recover as long as this card is on the field. And her continuous effect is whenever this card deals damage to your opponent, you can he, he or she discards a card. So basically, 
It's a three cost. If we want, we can make it five and, you know, pay the awakening, rest two resonators. They're not going to be recovering anytime soon, which, you know, is pretty handy and stuff, considering that uh, the last resonator that we've got in here... Uh, actually, no, it's not that last resonator. I tell a lie. I apologise. Uh, I tell a lie. There's actually one more uh, that is a three drop that we're running at two, and it's Kai the Frozen Heart. I mainly just threw him in here because I thought it was an interesting idea to play with. Obviously, we don't have the fire slash water fairy tale that can like remove counters and stuff, or whatever, but I feel like he's still like a pretty viable option. He's a three drop 12 12, and you know, the reason why he's uh, a three drop 12 12 can be apparent because when he enters, we put three frozen counters on this card. Uh, when he, this card cannot attack or block as long as it has a counter, and whenever a resonator that is put into the graveyard from our field, we remove a counter on it. So essentially, we can sacrifice three of our one drops, essentially, remove the counters from this guy, and then we have a 12-12 for like three costs, which isn't too bad considering that we don't really mind too much if we lose our one drops, uh, especially if we can get that 12-12, at least on our third turn or whatever, and then we can, you know, we don't need to worry about it too much. And then the other uh, last resonator that I totally uh, forgot uh, about over Kai there is we have Hamlin the Pied Piper, who again is from Ground Cluster. He's a 5-drop, 1,000-1,000, which may seem a bit expensive, but going into his abilities, when he enters, we rest the target resonator our opponent controls. It doesn't recover during the recovery phase as long as this card is on the field. And the continuous effect is whenever this card attacks, we rest a target resonator our opponent controls, and it doesn't recover until the recovery phase. So essentially, it's sort of like um, Etna's Awakening ability, except it's continuous and we can keep on doing it every time we uh, attack, which is pretty nice. So, like you know, it's like that Hamlin is putting all the resonators to sleep, which is pretty cool. Um, going on to spells and stuff, we are not running that many different ones, to be fair. Um, mainly because like the idea of it is just because we've got running so many resonators and stuff, we want to support them the best way we can. And one of the ways we can support them is by playing the Flower Kingdom, which is basically fairy tale support, which is really nice. It's a field edition, and our fairy tale resonators gain 200-200. And if we pay a blue and a void, then a target resonator loses all races and becomes a fairy tale until the end of the turn. So, like, if we wanted, we could just, um, like, decide that, oh, this random thing here is going to be a fairy tale. And I'm not quite sure why you would want to play that effect. I've still not found a very good reason for it yet, but, you know, we'll find it, find out sooner or later. We're running four of it, so we can at least get, if, like, in the off chance we do somehow manage to get all four of them out, that's, like, 800-800 onto everything. Very unlikely that we'd get four out, but I like to run four of field editions just in case, like, on the off chance it happens. Uh, next, we have Wall of Ideas, which is a one-drop water, and I really like, I kind of like fallen in love with this uh, spell chant instant. It's really useful, so like a target resonator gains either minus 800 attack or plus 800 defense until end of the turn. So we can essentially drain our opponent's attack or we can boost our own defense to make sure stuff lives, which I really like a lot, like considering it's blue. And blue spells are sometimes a little bit iffy depending on like what, how you're going to play or whatever. I really like this card, so I feel like I'm going to be putting it in a lot more blue decks that I run. Uh, next one we have is we're running three of the War Dance of the Valkyrie. This is mainly just in here because we happen to have Snow White and Cinderella um, who can like reduce the cost to pay this card. Or reduce the cost to play the card, I should say. Like in English, right? But like the main effect of it is obviously it deals 600 damage to a target pl uh, player or J Resnier. So it's sort of like a thunder, but not really a thunder. It's kind of weird. It's like we can target uh, our opponent or we can target a uh, Resnier. And if we uh, rest a recovered uh, Snow White and Cinderella, then we can do that instead of paying the cost of three. Which, you know, is, like, not too bad or whatever, but well, it'd probably even, like, just playing it from hand would be simple enough so we don't have to rest anything. And, of course, to work in tandem with Matchstick Girl, we have the Magic Matchstick, which looks really weird. I'm not going to lie. The card art is a little bit weird. It looks like there's like, these evil, wormy monster things trying to eat this Matchstick, and I have no idea why. Um, when we add this to Resonator, we can give it Swiftness and First Strike, and if we banish this card, it deals 200 damage to a target J slash Resonator. So mainly, we're only going to be running this in order to like use it in tandem with Matchstick Girl. Uh, that's really the only reason. I don't really see us actually attaching it to anything because, you know, it doesn't really do much for our Resonators or whatever. Like, we don't really need Swiftness on most of the stuff anyway. Most of the stuff is fine uh, missing a first turn of attack there, so we're mainly running it to work with Matchstick Girl. And last but not least, we are running four of Deep Blue, the Phantom Board, which is essentially the regalia that works well with this Alice. 
If we pay one blue, we can produce either a green or a red, obviously, because the other Alice is, I believe, a green and blue. So it works with both of the Alices or whatever. And if we pay two and tap this, we can search our main deck for a soldier resonator with total cost one, reveal it and put it in our hand. But if our J ruler is either one of those Alices that are named there, we can put it in the field instead and shuffle the deck. And if we discard another card named Deep Blue the Phantom Board, we can just produce fire, uh, water or wind, which is pretty nice. So we're running four of those because, you know, it's a regalia. It doesn't really technically need to pay too much in order to activate its abilities. And, you know, it's, you know, fills up four slots quite easily. And then moving on to our magic stones, which are not overtly complicated considering the kind of build that we're going with here. We are running four magic stone of hearth's core, which is produced either water or fire, simple enough. I will kind of miss these jewel stones when Grim rotates out. I kind of hope they do find a way to either cleverly reprint uh, jewel stones or maybe come up with new ones or whatever so that um, we have more options because jewel stones are like the handiest kind of stones that you ever get in this game. And then we are running three water and then three fire to kind of complement it and fill up the last six slots of the magic stone deck. Uh, we have we are mainly playing water, so which is why we're going to be looking towards water a lot more. But the fire is also handy in terms of like some of our spells and some of our resonators, which is why we're only really running three fire stones because we don't really run more than that. So anyway, guys, this was this deck profile video for Alice the Valkyrie of Fairy Tales. Let me know what you guys would change in this. I know that the like fairy tale builds do like change a lot depending on how people want to play them and they're focused on them. A lot of people would rather play Grim for a fairy tale deck just because he allows you to play any color of will for them. But I thought it'd be like interesting to like give like this Alice a bit of a chance because she is pretty cool and I think she was specifically built for fairy tales. So I feel like you know you need to give her a little bit of a chance. So until next time, guys, I will see you all later.